CDG BizCast. I am your host, Christian Gonzalez, co-owner of Creativity Design Group, a digital marketing firm in Houston, Texas. On today's episode of the CDG BizCast, we are going to be discussing what I call the Frank's Grill Effect. This is a phrase that I personally coined that describes a phenomenon where one restaurant dominates among several others within a certain block on a street. When several are clustered on one corner and they're all competing with each other, one out of all of them is going to be the biggest money maker. I've seen this happen many times throughout the Houston area. We're going to talk to a restaurant owner today to talk more about this effect and how a restaurant can truly bring their A-game when it comes to dealing with several nearby competitors. Joining me today is Michael Brown, owner of Jamboritos. Welcome back to the show, Michael. I'm glad to have you on again. How are you today? Christian, I'm doing great. Glad to be back with you again. Likewise. And as a restaurant owner, I wanted to ask you about this because I'm sure throughout your many years of being in the industry, you've probably seen it all when it comes to restaurant ownership. You've seen restaurants that are successful. You've seen some that sadly went out of business. And you've most likely have seen restaurants restaurants go head to head with each other and basically duke it out for a certain customer base. First, let me explain why I call this phenomenon the Frank's Grill Effect. So, over in West Houston, there is an extremely successful restaurant called Frank's Grill. They serve breakfast and lunch. They're on West Timer between Derry Ashford and Kirkwood. I've eaten there many times. And the place gets so busy, it gets so busy to the point that the dining room reaches capacity. I've seen people walk in through the front door only to walk right back out seconds later because there were no tables. There were no empty tables. It just seems like that they have this revolving door of customers that turn them themselves away because the minute they walk in they see that they're not going to be able to get a table anytime soon every stool at the bar is taken every individual table in the dining room is taken up all the booths are taken up there isn't one single seat left in the house for somebody to sit down now meanwhile while Frank's Grill is getting all this business right across the street there is a Luby's cafeteria now this Luby's has been operating at this Westheimer location for many years I remember it being there when I was a kid and at that time it used to be very busy but now it's very empty when you go inside even during the busiest of lunch hours when you go in there you're probably thinking that there's gonna be a long line of people on the serving line getting their food but when you step in you're gonna get right in line there's nobody else there you're gonna go right through the line and probably five to ten minutes or less instead of waiting in long lines and of course that's good that you don't have to wait in that long line but it's not good for them that business has been very slow for them for the past few years COVID did slow things down for them but it seems like that they just never recovered and in fact it got so bad for them that back in 2021 the original owner Luby's Cafeteria Inc went out of business they also own Fud Ruckers too Fud Ruckers got sold off 
They closed down several Luby's locations, and then their remaining ones got sold to an investor named Calvin Jin, who has kept several of them open, but several locations statewide have also closed as well, including a few in the Houston area. Also need to mention that several of the ones in the Houston area that closed were in much busier spots than the aforementioned Westheimer location. Usually when you go into the Westheimer location, there's nobody there. It's a ghost town. It's empty. You're guaranteed to get a table. The food's great, by the way, but sadly, they're not getting the business. Meanwhile, their biggest competitor across the street, Frank's Grill, is so busy that you can't get a table when you go in. Even the parking lot gets full. So that's why I call this phenomenon the Frank's Grill effect. I mean, I'm sure it happens everywhere else, but this is the specific example that comes to mind when I think of it. It truly is a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, especially in the restaurant business. That is especially true when your competitors are extremely close by. Now, my first question for you, Michael, is why are some restaurants more successful than others when they're competing in the same vicinity. Maybe they're on the same block. They might be a mile or two from each other, but they still compete. Why are some more successful than others? And what mistakes should restaurants avoid making to ensure that they remain successful, that they keep their position as the dominating restaurant in their area? Well, Christian, you're bringing out some really, really good points. And, you know, can we, can we just kind of dialogue about this? Because I have some questions that I'd like to throw back out to you. And I think by going back and forth with these questions and answers, because like you said, you were at these locations, you were there, you saw the diverse difference in the population that entered into the restaurants. So I'm going to throw some questions back at you, if you don't mind. And because I believe this will be help us and help others to also dissect what's really going on. Is that all right? Yes, of course. I'd love to hear your questions. Okay. So. And, and it's going to answer the question that will help our listeners um, succeed as they either enter into the business of uh, hospitality and restaurants or trying to expand their business or trying to overcome a deficit in their particular location. But we know that the commonality here is what we call location, right? And in the restaurant business, it is often said the number one rule in any business plan, anytime you're trying to raise money, is location, location, location. That's key. Why is that important, right? It's important because the more obscure your location is, it's harder for people to find you. And the more you're gonna have to invest in marketing to get people to actually come to your restaurant. By example, Michael's Backstreet Cafe opened up in 1989. I was the executive chef and owner along and we were in a cul-de-sac. So we were in a city that the sidewalks rolled up at nighttime. Absolutely almost zero business was going on when we were open. So we had to use serious guerrilla marketing tactics to get people to come to the restaurant. We went to the neighborhood suburbs. Now we were in a city, like in, I should say, in the inner city. So you had your, your five and dime stores, you had the post office, you had all those things, the activities, the offices and everything that were open during the day. But at nighttime, like I said, the sidewalks rolled up. Well, in order to make that business roll, it took us a year and a half of serious marketing where we would go to the suburbs, say, for example, my wife, who is a marketer and a public relations person, would say, hey, Michael, they're having a Billy Holiday celebration. And our theme in the restaurant was French Quarter, New Orleans. And so Billy Holiday and her, you know, rhythm and blues fit right in. And so we jumped out of bushes at that Billy Holiday show with advertisements for people and then saw business coming in that very next weekend. So what I want to talk about, because we're talking about location, and then just to let you know, after a year and a half, we got reviewed by the New York Times. And then it became standing room only. But again, that is a disadvantage when you're in a, a location that is so obscure that you have to go through a lot to get people to see you. But in this scenario with Luby's and Frank's Grill, we have both restaurants competing at the same location. I'm looking at both of their hours of operation. And Frank's Grill is a breakfast house and closes at 3 p.m., whereas Luby's is a lunch and dinner house it opens at 11 and closes at 8 p.m. So the first thing that I'm seeing here is that they're both going after different market segments. And so that could explain the difference depending on the hour that you visit them in how busy or how not busy they are. The other thing that we have to look at is how long has this concept been out there? Frank's Grill is well over 50 years old. I think Louis could be largely that old as well. But, you know, Frank's Grill is a place that caters to the locals, caters to the blue collar worker and so forth. 
Whereas Luby's caters more to the baby boomers and the uh, senior citizens who are on a fixed income and want to get the most out of every meal, continue to eat large portions. The other thing I would absolutely say as well is that when COVID hit, the buffet business, and, and, and am I right, is Luby's the buffet? Luby's is actually a cafeteria with a serving line. They're not a buffet. Okay. Okay, so it's semi-buffet because it's a cafeteria line, but it's such where they have food is sort of the old days when we went to school and, you know, this person was serving food off for the buffet? Yes, it's exactly like that. Okay, so that became less popular with COVID for obvious reasons. And so a lot of the buffets businesses got hurt. You know, the big China buffets and hometown buffets and all the different types of buffets got hurt because of the exposed food. Whereas I believe Frank's Grill is where you know the food is prepared and brought out from the kitchen to your table and also that lends itself better to pivoting during covid and doing takeout and delivery so i would say that when we're talking about these two competitors we have to understand what markets we're going after so if i'm louis and i'm in that situation i do have to understand who my market is and i have to understand what is my advantage right so i cannot necessarily be a frank's girl unless i changed my hours and opened up for breakfast i could possibly do that here's another question what is the seating capacity in the louis versus uh, frank's grill frank's grill is a very small restaurant in fact it's it's hard Hard to tell I don't know the exact capacity but it's a pretty small place versus Luby's they've got a much larger dining room that's the problem Frank's Grill doesn't have enough seating to accommodate how busy they get versus Luby's they have this huge dining room but nobody's eating there they do have a much larger dining room I don't know number wise what their capacity is but they do have a much larger dining room setting versus Frank's Grill theirs is definitely smaller in size so that's a that's a key point because one of the tactics that we use in the restaurant business is to say it's better to have a small dining room with a long waiting line because people are attracted to waiting lines even in the food truck business we we had that you know we had you know if you see 10 food trucks out there you see a long line at one food truck and you don't see the long lines at the other food truck you tend to go on that long line well the same thing with the restaurant business it's, it's better to open up a 50 seat dining room to have that overflow than to have a hundred seat restaurant and seat 70 people but you still have 30% that you can fill. So that in itself can make a difference. Now, and just the mere math tells you that as well that a smaller dining room is going to turn away people a lot quicker than a larger dining room. So again, I'm trying to put myself in Luby's position and talk about strategies to, to change this scenario. Now, our audience here might be looking at it from a different perspective. They might be considering going into business. Heck, they might even consider purchasing a Luby's. Who knows? They might be already in a situation like Luby's versus the Frank's Grill effect, hence that name. They might already be in a situation like that. But again, what they have to look at is who's their target audience and how do they get more of them? And then why did they have that target audience in the first place? What does their target audience actually want? In in this case, in Luby's is sitting there, they could do a survey of all their clientele and all the data that they have and find out if opening for breakfast would be an advantage, something desired. I remember one time I had a restaurant and I had two dining rooms, but I would not open the second dining room until I was totally overflowing in the first dining room. In a case like Luby's, that's very, very large. That might be achieved by with like room dividers for example. So you keep everybody in one part of the dining room instead of having it look so sparse and spread out. Not the perfect solution, but a possible quick fix. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that when analyzing location, there's more than just why one busy is busy versus the other. Oh, maybe it's the food. Well, it could be. Maybe it's the service. People value service over food all day long. Maybe it's the atmosphere, okay? Well, at what time of day is the atmosphere at Luby's less attractive than the atmosphere at Frank's Grill? Maybe it's the, I don't know exactly in this case scenario, if they're side by side or if they're adjacent to each other, but sometimes a simple thing as access and egress could make a person decide I'm gonna go here rather than there because I have to go make a U-turn to get into the parking lot, or this is right on the way to work, or this is, you know, there's different things that will cause people 
to patronize. And then ultimately, the idea is retention, right? So the goal is to satisfy or to give a great experience to 100% of the people that walk through your threshold. No one's perfect and no one's going to be able to do that 100%. But the more you do that, the more you retain, the more you create a thing called customer advocacy. And you have your customer, which I read a lot of the reviews from Frank's Place. They have a lot of customer advocacy because there are people that are saying Frank's Place is the best place to eat a burger. Frank's Place is great. They have great breakfast. They have this, they have that. In fact, years ago when they moved, I saw a review that said, where the heck is Frank's Grill? Somebody answered, they moved up the street. And somebody also said, well, they have a sign on the door that says where they are. And the person that found the answer to their question actually, like you could tell in their, what they typed into this review, they breathed a sigh of relief. It was a lifeline for them. If you can create your operation as a lifeline to the people, your patrons, you have um, marketing and advertising that goes beyond what you place in social media, what goes beyond what you place on a billboard or what you place in a magazine, it's word of mouth. So I hope that helps a little bit, somebody. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. Word of mouth is one of the best ways to get business. In fact, that's how CDG, my own business, has received many of its customers throughout the years. A word of mouth referral is the biggest way a pleased customer can tell the company that they just did business with, thank you. And I definitely agree. We've seen the power of word of mouth. We've seen how powerful word of mouth advertising can be. I mean, let's look back at a few examples. Just this past June, we saw the Grimace Shake at McDonald's explode in sales due to social media. Four years ago, we saw the chicken sandwich at Popeye's explode as well due to the buzz that was being made on social media. And more recently, with Taco Bell, the Beefy Crunch Burrito, which has a cult following, I guess you could say, on Facebook. There's a whole group dedicated to it called the Beefy Crunch Movement. They have managed to bring back this discontinued menu item quite a few times ever since it was introduced back in 2011 and reintroduced back to their menu here and there a few times. So the power of social media should not be underestimated. It couldn't make or break any business. Absolutely. Absolutely. When it comes to cult followings, I believe it's important for the owner to take charge of how that following you know takes place uh, for example you don't want a cult following that's taking your concept in a negative direction and, and it depends on your company philosophies and your core values right so a chick-fil-a for example who has christian based values in their businesses which henceforth they close on sundays is not going to want to have a cult following that takes one of their sandwiches and uses it as a phallic symbol right so these campaigns like you said this was revived what since 2011 this crunchy burrito for example there's some smart people behind all of this that are actually you know starting the process starting the wave and using social media to create hype and getting people on the bandwagon. It's not always something that happens organically. And if it does happen organically, again, you want to control the narrative and you want to make sure that it's not going in a direction that's against your, your core values in your company. Yes, I agree. I agree. Or else it's going to require having some serious PR, you know, public relations involved to help control it should it get out of hand. I mean, just for a moment, let's talk about the Grimace Shake at McDonald's. You remember what was going okay. on there? People were going on TikTok and just to be funny they were sipping on the shake and then pretending like that they had died right after they drank the shake. It's supposed to be for humor but the people at McDonald's were not too pleased about it. What's your take on social media? You know product on social media just basically creating this huge buzz. This product is on fire on certain social media platforms such as TikTok. In this case how do you feel about that? Well like I said earlier I think that it's important to any marketing, any advertisement, social media, you have to be in control of the narrative, but you can't always avoid the narrative from getting out of control. When that does happen, then you probably, like you said, you have to start to get into some PR. You want to check your legal position. is. It's an opportunity to come out to meet the same audience and to let them know where you stand on this matter. I think that's pretty much all you can do. You can't control what everybody does, but when the same audience in the world, for example, knows where you stand, then you're on record as making it understood that 
this is not something of your own creation. And we know that a drink or whatever that is that we're talking about is not going to kill anybody, but we certainly don't want to put that in people's minds that we are responsible or anything like that. Right, that's correct. It was all for humorous purposes, but McDonald's was getting tired of seeing it. The employees mm -hmm. especially were tired of making the shake as well. Moving on to my next question, you've kind of already answered this one already, but in addition to what you've already told me, what should restaurants strive to do in order to explode with success? And how should they stand out amongst all their competitors, especially if they are competing with restaurants that are on the same block as them? or just within the same vicinity in general? Well, I think the key is, well, there's so many ways to approach this. In an ideal situation, before you even open your doors, you set a standard in your business plan for how you're going to operate. You found out who your three buyer personas are, like 70% of your business is gonna come from this market segment. You've done all of your demographic researches, know you've located it within the area where they can reach you. That's the ideal, right? You've done all of this, you've done your prospectuses and your financials and you understand you know, what your break even points are, you understand where you have to be on all your numbers and that kind of thing. But you know, not everyone has all of that together. But when the question is about standing out, it's knowing who you're selling to, right? What is important to them? Now, a lot of times you hear, you know, have a niche. And instead of going after a wide variety, go after a niche market. And that helps you to target a specific audience and to stand out and to do some things well instead of a whole lot of things average. There's, there's a lot of good to be said about that. But let's say you're on a four corner and every corner has a breakfast house. And so you're basically going after the same market. Or let's just say you're serving the same type of food. But within that, you can delineate yourself from a market perspective. For example, corner A, corner B, corner C, and corner D. Corner A is serving the same breakfast, has the same hours, pretty much says the same thing, but they are in the higher price brackets and they bring in more quality meats and they have more of an upscale feel. Well, there is going to be a market segment that is going to love that, want that, and they're going to cater to that. Now, let's say you have a population of, just make it real simple, 100 people in this area and 100 people are going to have breakfast three times a week. They're going to choose to go which corner. Well, if your population study says that 40% of those 100 people are in a higher income bracket and they have more discretionary income, then it's a good chance that you can get most of them to come to corner A. Then you'll see there's a blue collar section of that 100 populace and they happen to represent 25% of the populace. And it's quite possible in corner B where the price is a little bit lower, the food is a little bit less quality, the service is a little bit more down home, the atmosphere is a little bit more down home, that you might get that 25%. So you see where I'm going with this. It's kind of like determining what the people want, how many of them you can access in your area, and then giving them what they want. And there's multiple ways of doing that. Personally, when we open Jamboritos, and we're looking at a spot right now in Missouri City, we found that this community is highly supported by Sienna Village. Sienna Village is an affluent neighborhood. And I ate at one restaurant where a guy said that during COVID, their business actually increased because Sienna Village said that they're not going to let this restaurant go down and any other restaurants on that strip. So they patronized them even all the more. And they said that when they had to close the dining rooms, their takeout expanded and exceeded their in-house business to the point where they had to hire more people. Well, when I sat down and ate with this a person who invited me to this restaurant, they said, the reason why they love this restaurant is because of, and they pointed to this man who was the manager who was going around from table to table, keeping it a down home feel and touching every table and making everybody feel comfortable. So that was what appealed to that market. So knowing what your people want, what they're going to buy and sticking to doing it well. So you might have on corner B, you introduce a $15 burger to corner B and they're used to spending $10 and they're happy with with a $10 platter and you say, well, no, this is, happens to be a Wagyu burger. Well, you might have a few people that eat it, but the more people that are going to eat it are going to be on corner A. But the ones on corner B, they're going to say, you know what? Just give me that burger that I've been liking all this time is good enough for me. So how you can stand out 
is all about who your market is, how you cater to them, how you're consistently catering to them, how you're constantly where they are. And now we're talking social media. For example, I have another business that I started right now, and it's a ministry business, an educational ministry business, and catering to pastors and church leaders. Well, they're, they're not going to necessarily be on TikTok, but they'll be on LinkedIn because it's more of a professional environment. I believe those are the basics for standing out. But always remember that there's a thing called table stakes. And in all of those four corners, there are certain table stakes that need to take place so that you can exist in business. One, accessibility. Two, friendly service. Three, good food. Four, clean operation. Five, uh, a staff that is welcoming. You know, they feel like they enjoy working there. And you can see that. And there's probably several others, but what I mean by table stakes is, is that there's certain expectations that no matter whether you're in a blue collar or whether you're in a, you know, upscale type of restaurant, there's certain things that you want to have always available, like the cleanliness, like the, the friendliness and all those things where you don't fall below the bar and become obsolete. All very well said. Those are some great key points. I especially love what you said about the table stakes. Every restaurant needs to meet all five of those table stakes. To me, if you're only meeting four out of five of them, you're not doing a good job. You got to strive for your A game every single time. Your customer is everything. Your customers are the kings and queens of your business. Without them, you don't have a business. I've always been a firm believer in delivering stellar customer service. In fact, I've done several other episodes of this show just talking about that. But when it comes to the restaurant business, you really need to be on your A game. There's no room for imperfection. There should be no four out of five star experience. Regardless of what business you're in, it should always be a five star experience. Be nice to your customers. Make them feel welcome when they come in. I agree with that. Your food has to be top-notch in taste, in appearance, in temperature, everywhere, and that's what keeps them coming back. My next question for you also relates to location. Now, in general, putting all the other factors that we've discussed so far, would you say that it is wise to open a restaurant in a location that is within the vicinity of several other major competitors that could possibly clobber your business? your restaurant. Well, is it wise to do that or is it better to open yeah. a restaurant maybe a little bit further away, not so close to them, not next door to them or just a block away or just a few feet away? Is it wise to do that and what's the recommended distance that you should have between your restaurant and your competitors? I've learned this the hard way when I was in the food truck business and that I used to think, you know, my food truck alone will just attract a lot of people. And there is a difference between food truck business and restaurant business for sure. But people, when I started caravanning with 10 food trucks, I got better business than I did when I was standalone. When it comes to the restaurant business, I think there's a thing called restaurant row. If you can be a part of restaurant row, you better dag on sure you need to do that because people are attracted to the destinations. They may not try you the first time they're in that neighborhood, but the next time they might. We experienced that with the food truck when we were lined up with 10 food trucks because we were caging in Arizona. It wasn't exactly well known in uh, cuisine and the burger and the, and the hot dog guy and the what else the barbecue guy and, and the pizza guy. They got all the business in the beginning, but a couple of weeks went by and people tried you know, my Cajun burritos and they were like, oh, this is great. And next thing you know, we have equally long lines, sometimes longer. So first of all, I think that being clustered with other restaurants is a good thing and it brings more people into the area and ultimately it can give you a better opportunity to compete because now you are being exposed more. So I think generally speaking, you know, you have that same concept in food courts. Now you have food halls like Finn Hall and these other guys who are putting six restaurants under one roof and sharing a bar and having the edifice of a, a really nice facility. So, you know, make it easy for your people to find you, be a part of what's going on and just do your best to make sure that you reach out, you know, because you can actually look at that person walking into somebody else's door and have somebody standing outside of your door and just smiling. You never know. They might look at you. We used to pass out free samples in the front of the food truck to get people who passed us by to, to try us. Depending on, of course, you know, the rules and regulations that exist in the area it depends on how much that kind of marketing you can do but it helps to be in grouped in with other restaurants and that is especially true in the fast food and the fast casual world how many times will you go down a highway and you will see applebee's and chili's and several others all really close to each other maybe even next door from each other and in fast food growing up in the neighborhood i grew up in there were several fast food restaurants clustered all on one corner and i still remember which ones 
ones that were there, all on the on one corner, there was a McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, Long John Silver's, Arby's, KFC, Shipley's Donuts, and then just a little further away from all that, maybe just a few blocks down, was a Taco Bell. And right. as you can see, why do they do this? Because it's healthy to be near your competitors. You want to cater to your customer in general who patronizes fast food restaurants, but you want to be where all the choices are. So if you have someone who doesn't really care which fast food restaurant they want, they just want to have something within that category, they might pick your restaurant out of all of them because your type of food is what they feel like having. So let's say, using the example I just gave, out of all the fast food restaurants I've picked, let's say somebody's driving through that neighborhood, they're hungry, they don't really know what they're in the mood for, and they decide out of all the restaurants they see, they are going to pull into Arby's. They're not going to go to McDonald's or Burger King. Maybe they just felt that it hits the spot differently because they serve food that's not as common as your typical hamburger or taco, right? Right. Burger King did that with McDonald's. You know, McDonald's, they took advantage of all the market research that McDonald's did, and pretty much they were just lockstep with McDonald's and opened up within a really close proximity to every McDonald's. That saved them a lot of money on market research. I would be happy to go up against a Chipotle. Be close fact, I think that this location that I'm looking at right now is within a mile and a half. And that's not close, but there maybe one day there will be an opportunity to be close to such a location. But like you said, you know, being in an area where people congregate to eat is nothing but residual profit if you handle it correctly. Yes, that's correct. It's good to be near where your customer is at. And it does help to be near your competitors as long as you are not clobbering yourself being near a competitor. You know what I mean? I've noticed this too. There is always a Burger King and a McDonald's. McDonald's close to each other and you know outside of the restaurant world you will often see now we're talking retail you will often see a Walgreens and a CVS near each other or a Target and a Walmart have you also noticed that as well it's the same principle you yeah. want to be where your competitors are because you're competing for the same target audience you want to be one of their options you don't want to be hiding somewhere where nobody will find you you've got to be out in the open the business world is a battlefield you need to know how to come to this battle prepared. Absolutely. And in our closing time here, I wanted to see, since we're talking about location, if I could share with the audience what a commercial condo is and maybe recommend or show some strength that could help them if they decide to open a restaurant. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Please tell us. So recently I found out about commercial condos because for Jamboritos flagship operation, I wanted to follow the McDonald's principle where they bought all of their land or they bought all the buildings that their lands were on, buildings and the land. But there's an interim step that I found called purchasing a commercial condo. So you know how a regular condo, you own the condo, you pay for it, you have a deed and deal with associations and common area maintenance that, but you still own this deed and you have the benefit of real estate appreciation or you have the benefit of that equity buildup. So there are sets of those condos are called commercial condos. In this particular location, they have a building with seven units in it, each of them 600, 1,695 square feet. And so I'm willing to be purchasing that section of the building. What the good thing about that is I can pay myself the mortgage with my holding company and have my managing company run the restaurant. In this type of location, at the end of say nine years, that mortgage would be paid off 100% and everything that came into the restaurant at a tune of about five or $6,000 for occupancy costs would actually go into the pocket plus any type of equity that was built up. So I just want to share that with your listeners. If you can get an opportunity to find a builder who's selling commercial condos for your restaurant, you'll be a lot better off in 15 years when it comes to the bottom line and the equity and your assets, having a commercial condo as opposed to paying lease which gives you absolutely nothing at the end of every lease term. That is extremely smart thinking right there. I could tell that you were born to be a restaurant owner, Michael, because you're always thinking ahead. You're always thinking of the best possible ways to run a restaurant and from the start to finish. And I agree. That is a very good strategy right there. I hope other restaurant owners are paying attention to this because you will see some great rewards at the end, correct? Correct. Now, here's the thing I would also say is this, and I don't think it's a downsize, but Let's say in the average lease in a restaurant today is a two-year lease with a three-year option. So you can go in in two years, pay 6000 7000 a month. At the end of two years, you've paid about 200000 
and you find that your concept doesn't work and you just walk away. In the scenario with the condo, you have the option to bring in a new tenant and have them pay you and that place is still fully set up as a restaurant. Or you have the option of taking that space and repurposing it for another business. So I'll let you guys figure out whether that's an advantage or a disadvantage to you, but I'm thinking it's a pretty good advantage. It certainly is a great way to repurpose your space without the restrictions of a lease because if you get locked into a lease and you decide you want to go out of business you'll close your shop you'll close up your restaurant but you're still contractually obligated to hold on to that space until your lease runs out and who wants to pay rent on a space that you can't use right right Right. And I will say also the location, location, location is important because this recently I was looking at a place, but it was in a really great city, but it was off the street. It was like, you know, 200 yards off the main drag and it was a ghost town, just literally 200 yards off of Highway 6 was a ghost town. So this new location is right on the main street. And so try to get on the main street. And my closing question for you, Michael, is what will Jamboritos do to be like Frank's Grill in this scenario? What are you going to do differently versus your competitors that where you can expect to see capacity limits being filled, parking lots being filled, just so busy that you're going to have no choice but to hire more staff? What is Jamboritos going to do to be like this? Wow. Well, I'm going to try to stay high level on this so that I don't give away all of my trade secrets. But I'll say this. We're going to utilize technology. You know, you've heard me say this before, technology is cool, but it's not the rule. So we're going to utilize technology to enhance the guest experience and the personalized touch. Then I'll let people figure out what that looks like, but I already know what it's going to look like. We're going to utilize technology to make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt, before you walk out those doors, we know whether you had the Jamboritos experience we wanted you to have or did not. A lot of the times when people get to their cars or people click on the website and they, they click off your website or they place an order and then have buyer remorse or whatever it is, I think technology can help us find out and subvert the negative problems that can come that will happen in a restaurant we're going to use local farmers and local businesses to help support for our products we're going to have an open kitchen feel okay we're going to have a smaller dining room and a larger kitchen which i always and i didn't just make this up but we always say the kitchen is the engine and so because of the trends right now with takeout and delivery dining rooms don't have to be as large as they used to be but within that dining room you can bet sure that you have a feel of that french quarter by you feel that we want to create in the restaurant with all that jazz and that stuff playing in the mic you know we're going to also have a very local feel in terms of who we have working there and so every shift will have what we'll call a house mother or a house father someone who's just like you know your mother would go around and say are you enjoying your food you know somebody like that where they're always on the scene we're going to be involved in a lot of local charities the things you know the local high school events and the things that are they're doing the pta the you know just like what we've always done in some in all of our other operations have a food truck food truck will be a marketing arm as well as for catering and doing pumpkin patch events and all the local church events. This particular area has a church almost on every corner. And then the one thing that will be unduplicatable will be actually the flavor of the food because I have my own seasoning and my own seasoning is personally blended and made to have a certain unique taste. And so that taste itself will be hard to replicate anywhere else. So that'll be our, one of our strong differential advantages. And then as you know, I came from fine dining and I got the service bug years ago and service is a high priority for me. So I'm always making sure that whether you come in the restaurant with a suit and tie or whether you come in the restaurant with flip-flops on, you're treated like gold no matter what. So we, we just want everybody to feel this place not only when they walk in the doors, they can feel the vibe, but when they leave outdoors, they're just so excited about their experience, they're ready to tell everybody. Right. You want to be all inclusive towards everybody. Holistic, yes. I certainly see Jam Burritos as being a number one success, especially in your area. And I personally can't wait to try some of your recipes myself. The big day is coming. I am more than honored that you have chosen CDG to be your partner for the website design aspect of it. I know things are going to work out really great for this concept. There's nothing like it in the area. 
you. The food sounds delicious. I say go for it. God's got your back. I've got your back. You've got your family who's got your back. Thank you so much. Yes, and I would like to conclude on that note. Michael, you were definitely born to be a restaurant owner. I love everything that you've had to share. You've shared a lot of great information with us today, and I hope that other business owners out there have taken some great note. All you business owners who are listening right now, I hope you took some great notes because you've just learned some great advice from the king right here. Amen. Well, listen, guys, Kristen Gonzalez is a man after my own heart and a creativity design group is a, a webmaster and marketer after everybody's heart. So definitely continue to tune in to the information that he wants to share with everybody because his goal is to make everybody successful in their endeavors. So thank you, Christian, for this time. And I really enjoyed it and looking forward to the next opportunity to share with your fans what we try to do out here. Thank you, Michael, for joining me on the show once again. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Awesome. And as I say in New Orleans, les les bon temps which means let the good times roll.